um, appreciate this. Um, okay. And these are the four things that he mentions. And, uh, and at first, when I came across this little text, uh, it was like, um, um, it didn't say much to me. But then later I, I, I thought about it and uh, I think, yeah, this is actually very universal, all of this. And uh, we can see much of this now coming back when we see the mindfulness movement arising in the West. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, there's also a lot of universal things that we can mention here. So let, let's, let's just go through that because many of these things are in fact very contagious. <laughs> the first one, freedom from desire, that may sound like it's not something that we all agree on whether that's good, but in here it specifically means desire that doesn't really help us. So um, there's a common idea that Buddhism is against all desire. This is, this is actually not uh, what the Buddha taught, but he said that uh, we can desire for happiness, for our own happiness and the other people's happiness. And, but there's a lot of desires that do not help us. For example, if we are more content with life, then we tend to cut out a lot of desires by nature, naturally, when we are just focused on the things we really need. That is not something that people disagree on. That's something all the uh, sages of the ages have agreed on. Generosity is also something good. Mm. Unless you're Ebenezer Scrooge, <laughs> this will generally be something that all world religions agree on. And also most philosophies. Self-sacrifice, simplicity, these are all examples of what we call in, uh, in, um, in what the Buddha calls here, non-desire or freedom from desire. So these are like the good qualities that help us to make us more happy, make us more in the present moment when we do not have to um, have to have a lot. Uh, we have to connect to a lot of things and people, but we can be content with what we have and also the people around us. So these are some very basic things that we can all agree on, but there's more to it. There is loving kindness. Now the other day, uh, actually, for the cup, past couple of days, those who are uh, like to listen to online meditations, as I, I've just heard of a couple of you mentioned that, um, loving kindness uh, has been a major team in the last week by Lumpi Budin. He's mm. been doing a series on loving kindness and the other um, three qualities of the heart and the head which you might uh, want to listen to sometimes when he's teaching. That is uh, usually around 12 o'clock in the uh, at noon uh, when we calculate to UTC. So I don't know what that is in Eastern time, but that should be about uh, in the morning, I think, uh, maybe seven o'clock in the morning or something like that. Okay, well, during your, just before you start breakfast, you might want to listen mm -hmm. to him. He's actually doing a very nice series about these. So the, one of these qualities of the heart, which is the most essential one, is loving kindness. And loving kindness is basically what we call, I think in Christianity, it's called agape, which means the kindness, the loving kindness that is universal, as opposed to one particular person, we have a loving kindness that is universal and you want to give. Now in Buddhism, this comes from the basic idea mentioned in many in several buddhist texts that we understand that we are the same as other people in one respect that we all want to be happy if you understand that you want to be happy and other people want to be happy and that we are not different in that then there is a cause for being wanting to be kind to others empathy starts according to buddhist ethics when we realize that we are very similar in the way we are all wanting ourselves to be happy. This is a, a very 
uh, kind of odd part of, of Buddhism, which is very different from the way we think in the Judeo-Christian Western tradition, uh, or perhaps it doesn't have to do with Christianity, but much, but more with our Western culture. Um, so in, in Buddhism, there is not a clear divide between uh, being uh, uh, taking good care of your own uh, happiness and being altruistic. So the Buddha, he once said in a well-known uh, teaching that having traversed all quarters with the mind, one finds none anyone dearer than oneself. Likewise, each person holds himself most dear. Hence, one who loves himself should not harm others. So this means <laughs> that, that we all, it's kind of like the Buddha turns it around. So he says, everyone loves himself the most. But because of that, we can therefore be empath have empathy for each other because we are all the same. And therefore, we should not hurt another. It's kind of a... Um, another way of thinking and uh, but it's very comes down to what is also known as the golden rule <laughs> and you may have heard of this it is uh, well known in philosophy it is a rule that is found in every world religion there's a number of examples that you that are mentioned here if you are using a, a computer screen rather than a telephone you can see that pretty well Buddhism says, for example, in the um, Udana Waka is actually the same as the Dhammapada. Treat not others in ways that you yourself wouldn't find hurtful. Of course, the most well known in the West is the one in Christianity that says, do not do unto others what you do. Um, what's it said again? <laughs> Let me just look at that. Um, in everything do to others as you would have them do to you, for this is the law and the prophets. That is from uh, Matthew, from one of the Gospels. And um, there's also the opposite when it says, do not do unto others what you do not want others to do to you. Those, those are both in the Gospels. So you can find this in Buddhism also. And uh, apart from the quote that I just mentioned, there is also a quote that says, all tremble at violence, all fear death, comparing oneself with others. I'm sorry, the language is a bit off here. One should not kill or cause to kill. Comparing others with oneself, it's been very really literally translated. Comparing others with oneself, one should not kill or cause to kill. So in other words, when we want to do good to other people, we should have empathy. And when we have empathy, we tend to want to love other people. But why is it then, this is a question that has been asked by a well-known psychologist who is known as, uh, as Daniel Goleman. And Daniel Goleman is a person who's been working a lot with uh, Buddhists as well. He's never said that he was Buddhist, I think, but he's, uh, worked a lot with uh, Buddhist um, philosophers and uh, uh, practitioners. Um, he's the one who's popularized emotional intelligence, mm -hmm. EQ, which is pretty widely used these days in whether you're going to um, get a, a new job, then you might have to do a test for that, EQ. He asked a question in, uh, in, in his research, also in this TED talk here. If by nature people like to help each other, then why don't we? Because we can compare ourselves with others, we should have empathy. Then why don't we have empathy, you know? As I, as I just mentioned, um, loving kindness is and empathy is mentioned in every world religion. Then why is there still so much war and violence? This is a question that he asks. In other words, why is loving kindness by itself not contagious? But actually it is, I would argue. And that is also what he says, but there is one thing that he mentions that we should have combined with loving kindness. He says, mindfulness is very important. He actually mentions a study when people read about um, very good stories about compassion, and then it turns out that in that study, they do not respond to that 
very good story about loving kindness and compassion, but rather when they have been given the time to be aware and mindful, they are responding, they are going to be more kind and compassionate. And from that, he concludes that mindfulness is actually the key factor in being kind. Or in other words, what we say in English language, you need to have care uh, come, and then you can have loving kindness. So mindfulness is also very important. That's why in the present day, actually, the whole mindfulness movement is very much an important part of meditation, making meditation better known. And it's also very important in Buddhist psychology and practice. I think, I think it's very uh, warranted and very justified that it's been quite a fashion these days to talk about mindfulness because it's such an important quality that we are lacking more and more as technology progresses in the present day. So what is mindfulness? Mindfulness is what we learn when we keep up, when we bring the center of the body into our daily lives. We have more focus. We have more freedom. As you will notice, when we meditate, we tend to go outside of the box. We tend to Maybe you have noticed that when you meditate and you come out of your meditation, you, you tend to be more mindful, but you also tend to be more creative, seeing mm -hmm. outside of the box. And there's also another part that mindfulness and meditation give us wisdom and they give us also help us to stay to our moral principles. In other words, purity. So, these are some examples of how mindfulness works in our life combined with meditation. And therefore meditation is also very important. In Buddhism, we call meditation, we call it um, right concentration. I'm almost through. This is the last part. But um, right concentration is actually uh, the same thing as meditation, just that the word meditation is the, 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 is the modern Western word and right concentration is the traditional Asian word which is also still used in yoga. Um, for example, um, in many yoga classes, they will talk also about an Eightfold Path and that is from the founder of yoga, Patanjali. Patanjali, he also talked about right concentration. So this is uh, more than only in Buddhism. Right concentration is when you have this little guy mm -hmm. and then he has a very pure mind, a mind of good quality. And then you have a soft and pliant mind. It can easily apply itself to any task at hand. It is happy. You can easily concentrate, easily think things through, and you can easily focus on something positive rather than complaining. <laughs> and um, so right concentration is basically what happens when we meditate. In that, it's not exactly the same as mindfulness. Let me explain that. If you compare mindfulness with a screwdriver, and now we are getting a, lisp, a, little, a little less poetic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, Thai teachers, Thai Buddhist monks, who are of course also my teachers, they can be very practical in their metaphors. <laughs> we tend to be more poetic in the West, but they are very practical metaphors. So this is the, when you hold a screwdriver and you hold it against the screw or the wall, and this is when you start turning it in. So when you are turning the screw into the wall, that is when it becomes meditation. So mindfulness is being aware in the here and now, and it's very, very important and also universal, as we already discussed, gotcha. mm -hmm. universally good. But meditation 
goes deeper. It actually goes deeper inside. And if you notice in meditation, you will feel that there is a certain depth, several mm -hmm. layers. As you progress in meditation, you feel that there is a relaxation within the relaxation. There is a certain uh, depth in meditation, which you do not, do not have in mindfulness. You could say that meditation in a way is the third dimension of mindfulness to put it very in very fancy terms. So these are some examples. Uh, and, and actually the nicest thing is that all these qualities uh, are all very universal and widely appreciated. For example, um, I know of one um, um, Orthodox Christian monk who lives like a hermit. And he lives in Holland in a little village where he's very isolated, uh, a bit isolated, uh, but uh, he, he does meet people. He does meet people. He has this long beard like uh, Orthodox monks do. And he also told me that, uh, that he has a sort of meditation. He, he didn't call it meditation, but he, he, he uses a, a prayer and then he repeats it all the time in his mind. And this is his way to practice mindfulness wherever he goes. He will, he will be reminded of Jesus in this way. So in a way, mindfulness is not just the modern fashion, but it's always been very universal. Uh, how do I go back to my previous slide? Oh, here it is. So, If we go back again to four things that everyone appreciates, right mindfulness, right concentration, loving kindness, freedom from desire. And these, you need to have each of those to go a little further. Freedom from desire helps us to develop loving kindness. If you're still wanting, you cannot give. Right mindfulness helps us to develop more deeper loving kindness. And right concentration helps us to develop more right mindfulness. It Venerable goes Sander, yes. can we ask questions or do you want to wait yes. till the end? Okay. Um, I'm just going through the conclusion, just a moment. Okay. We have uh, some time for questions. We are until 1.30, right? Oh, I mean, it can go on as long as you're not sleepy. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> oh yeah last i think one session one session we didn't log off until nine o'clock which was half an hour past our eight thirty mark so it's more oh, really? of yeah it's more of whatever questions we have and whatever time you have um so yeah okay. i just so, have to write it down so i don't forget what i was gonna ask oh, you. okay yeah so these are four qualities that are very important i was just going to mention that um these are like qualities that when we are um, when we pay attention and develop them in our lives, they will also tend to carry over to other people. And uh, I think you will have noticed that. Isn't that right? Oh, yeah. We, had, uh, we have people constantly like Pat and Marshall. I mean, everybody, the majority of people, are, they're always inviting other people to join, especially now that it's easy to meditate with us. We have so many people sharing meditation. So I definitely have an opportunity to, to see people sharing and wanting mm. to um, share the goodness, essentially. Yeah. There's a, a little uh, story. You may, you may have heard of the book, uh, Paying It Forward. It's also made into a movie. Um, that principle is actually very important in Buddhism as well. And, and, and it, I think it holds for these four principles that I mentioned before. When we are meditating, like you mentioned, you would like to share that with others. When you are loving, when you are kind to others, there is a domino effect. People are going to be kind to others as well. Like you, you want to give something to other people. And when you give something to other people, then the, they tend to want to do that to other people as well. Even if we do not notice, actually many of the good things we do throughout the day or any day, they will be <clears throat> forwarded 
to others. And um, you know, I once had the opportunity to interview the person who wrote the book, Paying It Forward, Pay It Forward, oh, wow. uh, for my uh, uh, a newspaper for the university, which I had uh, helped to run when I was a student. And um, she actually was very helpful. And um, I cannot even remember her name. I'm a little bit ashamed of that. <laughs> I didn't think I don't think she she helped produce the movie, but uh, her book was made into that movie. And there's a very nice scene in that movie when the, the little kid draws out draws on the board that he believes that if every person will just give whatever goodness they have received and pay it forward to another person, then we will have we will have goodness uh, that goes viral. And and that is mentioned in a time when the, the whole idea of being something being viral was not even known yet. There's a story in the time of the Buddha and this story is about Anatta Pindika. And I will finish with the story and after that you can ask any question like. <laughs> um, Anatta Pindika was an important supporter of Buddhism and he had a little granddaughter and she was very young and some of the one of the servants or one of the people who worked in the household she had made a little doll out of biscuit for this kid for this child in other words she made it out of some sort of uh, grain or some sort of uh, uh, some sort of uh, flour flour and uh, this little biscuit doll the the child was very much identified with it and the the person who gave the doll to the child to the little granddaughter he she said to her this is your daughter so you can take good care of it and of course the child actually believed that this little doll was her daughter so when she accidentally dropped the doll it broke and of course, she would cry it very much because it was made out of biscuit. So it was not a very strong doll. <laughs> and when it broke, she felt she had lost her daughter. And nobody could comfort her. She was very sad and she cried all the time. And then Anata Pindika, her grandfather, he was very wise. So he thought, I will take this opportunity to teach my granddaughter something. So he said, we may not be able to revive your daughter, but we can uh, share our good deeds with her. So he brought his granddaughter to see the Buddha. And then they, did, they gave a gift to the Buddha and to his uh, following of monks and they gave some food to them and the child was very happy to join in that offering and then they shared that good karma with the daughter the biscuit who had the little doll who had uh, in who had who was broken which was broken and because of that the child was comforted and happy and of course, uh, we cannot share our good karma with a doll. But this story shows that Anatta Pindika was very wise and he have had a way to teach people to solve things with good deeds. Now, the point of this story is that after that, when people heard that this little child was so wise that she understood that she could uh, take good care of her daughter by doing good, then, and then of course also honor her in that way, then a lot of people in that province, they started to do good deeds as well. They started to pay it forward. They started to, the thing became viral. Now, when I first heard of this story, I thought it was just, you know, an embellishment, you know, the, the people who write those texts, they like to make for the fairy tale more spectacular, but then, I realized that that was probably how it really happened because when there were a few 
Thai kids who were stuck in a cave about a year ago, if you remember, the entire world wanted to have empathy with that little, those little children in that cave and wanted to help. So whenever we have empathy, sympathy with somebody doing good, we would like to also join in with the goodness. And it's said that uh, the entire province, the entire area, uh, all went to do good and uh, be generous because of the example of this little child. So when goodness goes viral, it can be very strong. And I've said this already several times in my um, online teachings that if we can persuade everyone in the world to meditate, we will develop herd immunity because uh, the strongest way to work on your immune system is by meditation. So these are some examples of how goodness can go viral. <clears throat> and there's of course also the example of our temple, which has also started from a few people and now has become uh, a large temple with a lot of good deeds and a lot of good activities and many people who meditate together. So um, this is my presentation for today. Oh, Simon, you're also here. I hadn't noticed that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I was late. Yes. I think I, I just saw also uh, a few other people.